Good morning, everybody. My name is Lisa Jacobson. I'm the president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, and I'm very pleased to be a, uh, a contributor to what will be hopefully a really good discussion on energy efficiency, investment, and market trends this morning. On behalf of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and the Alliance to Save Energy, we are very pleased to be working in a collaborative fashion with the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. This is the second in a series of three briefings that the Business Council for Sustainable Energy will be hosting this year in commemoration of our 20-year anniversary. And what we're trying to do with these briefings is give all of you a real-time view on what's happening in a range of clean energy markets in the United States. So there will be some policy discussion as the um, agenda points to, but we really want to give you a sense of what's happening on the ground with regard to investment trends, financing models, and jobs, most importantly, because the economy is paramount to everybody. I'd like to quickly just uh, focus on the Business Council for Sustainable Energy's members. We are a coalition of renewable energy, energy efficiency, and natural gas industry sectors. We're 50 companies and associations currently. If you go to our homepage, you can see through this interactive map where our major assets and projects are with just within our membership. So this is just a, a view of what's going on with clean tech industries and jobs on the ground. And our website is www.bcse.org. As I mentioned, we're doing this series in commemoration of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy's 20-year anniversary, so I want to please quickly acknowledge the sponsors of the series. We could not do these series without their financial and uh, content support. They are the American Gas Association, Johnson, Co Johnson Controls, uh, the Polyiso Cyanurate Insulation Manufacturers Association, the Center for Environmental Innovation and Roofing, the North American Insulation Manufacturers Association of America, Sempra Energy, and Solar Turbines. And we hope that that list will grow. So if you'd like to get involved in our anniversary program, please don't hesitate to contact me at the Business Council. And for those that would like to tweet about this event, please feel free to, to do so. We've got a few of you in the room, so have some fun. Hopefully we'll give you lots of interesting insights to share. So with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rob Mosier, who's the Director of Government Affairs for the Alliance to Save Energy. Rob? Thank you, Lisa. Uh, as Lisa rightly pointed out, I'm Rob Mosier with the Alliance to Save Energy. And on behalf of the Alliance to Save Energy, we're also very pleased to be partnering with the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and the caucus on this excellent briefing. We hope it will be informative and substantive for all of the participants and the panelists involved today. But before we, we get to the panelists, I'd like to just briefly give a few comments and bits of information about the Alliance to Save Energy. Uh, we're currently celebrating our 35th anniversary. Uh, we are a coalition uh, organization with 160 plus members, which includes small and large businesses, energy efficiency and environmental advocates, trade associations, and consumer groups. We're headquartered here in Washington, D.C., and we all work collaboratively not only on policy advocacy, research, standards, education, communications, with the specific purpose of advancing energy efficiency worldwide. Um, so why energy efficiency? Well, there are a number of reasons. Um, today's political and economic challenges make it increasingly difficult to advance national energy policy. Um, but the quickest, cheapest, and cleanest way to address our energy demands has always been and will continue to be energy efficiency. Because these initiatives and investments and strategies help businesses and consumers save money, lessen dependence on imported energy sources, reduce pollution, and improve America's global competitiveness. Because really, no one is in favor of wasting energy. And the least expensive fuel is the energy that we don't use. In fact, without the numerous energy efficiency improvements for the last 35 years, excuse me, made since 1973, the United States as a whole would have used 50% more energy throughout the entire economy. 
And even with these gains, the U.S. Energy Information Administration still predicts or projects that by 2020, excuse me, 2035, there will be an increase of 9 percent in the energy consumed. So despite the progress, we're still using too much energy. And there are other strategies and initiatives that could be employed, um, some of which will be discussed by our panelists today and their operations and what they're employing to make their businesses, their organizations more efficient. And furthermore, the Alliance projects that this year, the average American household will use more than $5,500 on energy costs. That's quite a bit of money. And that's an increase of 14% from just two years ago. And there are a number of studies that have indicated, including one that was conducted by the Brookings Institute that was released last year, that indicates that the energy and resource efficiency segment of the economy accounted for more than 830,000 jobs nationwide. So not only does energy efficiency save money and provide a better bottom line for businesses and consumers, it also creates jobs. Uh, so at a time when Americans are struggling financially, uh, energy efficiency policies, initiative strategies offer real solutions to help with not only their bottom lines, but address the short and long-term problems associated with energy consumption and improving our economic outlook and addressing some of the problems associated with natural, national security, environmental concerns, and our economic uh, outlook for the nation going forward. Before we turn over to our panelists, I'd like to very quickly introduce Bill Parsons. Bill currently serves as the Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislative Director for Representative Chris Van Hollen, who is the co-chair of the House Renewable and Energy Efficiency Caucus. In addition to working closely with his counterpart, Lisa Wright, for Representative uh, Roscoe Bartlett, Bill's legislative portfolio includes all energy matters. Um, and like Lisa, Bill is a very trusted and knowledgeable source for stakeholders like the Alliance and BS BCSE, and has been a, a very good working partner uh, for many years on these matters. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Bill. Thanks. I, I'm going to be brief. I just, on behalf of uh, Congressman Van Hollen, and I'll, I, I think Lisa will in, indulge me and, and let me also extend greetings on behalf of, uh, of Mr. Bartlett, who is our Republican co-chair of the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. Um, I want to welcome you to uh, today's event. We're pleased to be partnering with ASE and the Business Council on it. Um, uh, just a quick blurb on, on the caucus. Uh, founded in 1996, uh, one of the oldest largest and continuously operating caucuses in the House of Representatives, founded on a bipartisan basis, operates on a bipartisan basis. If you are here from a Democratic office, if you are here from a Republican office, and this kind of event is of interest to you, the uh, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus can and should be a home for you on the Hill. Uh, if your member is not already uh, part of the caucus, please get in touch with myself or Lisa. Um, we have uh, 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 two marquee events we do uh, every year on, on, as a budget briefing and then the expo during the summer. Many of you uh, are either aware of or have attended uh, in the Cannon Caucus Room. Uh, and also events like, uh, like this uh, for important stakeholders um, uh, in our community. So I do want to hand it over to the experts you came uh, to hear, but I, I also wanted uh, to welcome you and, and to invite uh, any office interested in participating uh, to sign up uh, two weekly listservs, uh, event calendars for events like this, as well as uh, news clips uh, in uh, all areas related to clean energy. So please be in touch with myself, Bill Parsons, or Lisa Wright. We're both in the global address list uh, if membership is of interest to your office. Thanks so much and have a great event. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bill. And I would just note that the third in our series will be held on October 9th in the Rayburn Building, and it will focus on renewable energy. So anyone who signed in today will get notification of that, and obviously we'll hear 
through the caucus itself. So hope to see you there. But now, energy efficiency. Our first panelist today is Ted Hesser. He is the Energy Smart Technology Analyst with Bloomberg New Energy, Fi New Energy Finance. Bloomberg has also been gracious enough to participate in this series with us, and we hope that they will again on renewable energy. They did in our first one back in May. I'd like to point you all to the program where on the back you'll see more detailed bios for all the speakers. So with that, let me give the floor to Ted. Here's the remote, too. Great. Thanks, Lisa. I'm going to need to scroll through. I'll do it for you while you start. OK, great. So, so thank you for, for inviting me today. I'm honored to be here. Um, I wanted to just quickly go through some of our, our latest research on the energy efficiency landscape, broadly defined. And I'm going to take a broad definition at first. So that includes things like grid scale storage and smart grid as well as traditional energy efficiency in the built environment. So this figure shows um, a disaggregated view of an index. Um, it's an index that we created with Deutsche Bank. That's, um, they actually administer an exchange traded fund through this index. So it's an investable index in public equities for broadly defined the clean energy industry. And it's broken out into wind companies, solar companies, and energy efficiency companies, or as we call it, energy smart technology companies. And what you see is, is that the energy uh, efficiency companies have been far more stable, far less volatile um, in stock performance, um, and have consistently performed better than what is the MSCI World Index, which is kind of like the S&P, only it's a more global, more standardized average index. So, Energy efficiency companies, broadly defined, um, are way less volatile than wind and solar companies and consistently a little bit um, better. They're performing a little bit better. In the last year and a half, wind and solar companies have, have really performed very poorly um, for publicly traded equities. Now, there's a ton of companies in all of these categories that aren't publicly traded companies. Um, and with any really broad macro, macro view, there's a thousand caveats. So, so this is just to set the stage. Um, another way to look at market activity is venture capital and private equity investment. So this is cumulative venture capital and private equity investment that we track. Um, and it's, it's categorized by wind and solar and biofuels and geothermal and CCS and you know, everything you can think of in the clean energy universe, along with energy efficiency related investments. And what we find is increasingly, again, in the past three or so years, um, energy efficiency, venture capital, and private equity investments represent the bulk of investments, around 30 to 40 percent. Um, so the VCPE community um, is increasingly investing in energy efficiency-related business models and technologies over solar and wind, um, those being the other two biggest chunks. So the biggest success story within that broadly defined category has really been smart grid. Um, again, we track global smart grid projects, cumulative investment, things like that. And what we found is over the past four years, the industry has grown at a 45% compound annual growth rate, which is giant. It's off the charts, um, up to about 14.4 billion. So as a global industry, it's, it's big, it's hefty. Um, we think that's going to taper off and be more like 12% compound annual growth rate over the next four or so years. But that's still pretty impressive. Um, most of that has been for smart meters, and then a big chunk, about 30%, has been for distribution automation. Um, and then a smaller chunk has been for advanced smart grid activity, which is kind of um, trials and demonstrations and in-home displays and all the, all the fancy. Um, well, I think you're going to hear more about it from, from Qualcomm. So um, I'll jump from there. And we, we've also broken this out geographically just to show how the US is doing, because what I just showed is global. And the US. Um, Got a big boost on the back of ARA, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. There was about $4 billion invested in smart grid, and it went, cumulative investment in the U.S. went up to about $5 billion, but it's going to decline. Um, so the U.S. industry and the U.S. marketplace and companies tied to it are actually on a, a declining trend, whereas emerging market opportunities um, and Europe, where there's a lot of policy mandates for smart grid, are actually um, going to boom in the next, next few years. So that was the... Smart grid side of things. The storage side of things is not as rosy. Um, this, this picture shows four or five of, of the pure play battery storage equities um, that are publicly traded. And they've, they've really kind of fallen off the map. They're all trading for under a dollar a share, which means they're very close to being delisted, um, which is not good. So 
you know, an A123 is probably the most prominent company within this list. Um, an A1 through 3 did receive a lot of support from the federal government. Um, and their, uh, it was their CTO, he, he just left recently, um, which further caused the stock price to decline. So the battery storage industry is not doing as well. And the reason basically is that demand for electric vehicles did not manifest to the extent that people thought it would. And so supply contracts for a lot of companies didn't come through to the extent that they thought they would. So a lot of these companies are increasingly providing their technology to grid scale storage, um, which they're trying to, to form the market, but that's a nascent market. There's, there's a lot of work to be done there. So although the stock prices are declining and the industry uh, is struggling, that needs to be contrasted with the fact we're tracking the price point of lithium ion batteries by surveying manufacturers. And uh, this purplish line shows what you would think the, the natural decline in price would be by following standard learning curves within the industry, historical learning curves, um, which we know really well because we've looked at what happened, what's happened with lithium ion batteries in the consumer electronics industry. Um, anyway, what we're finding by indexing um, the actual price is that it's, it's decreasing a much faster rate than what you would think with a traditional learning curve. So, and Chinese prices are coming in really, really low. So what this means is there, there comes a point at which both lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles and grid scale storage reach, reach parity points, essentially. Um, and so the game is very much how, how do companies that are just providing these technologies kind of bridge the divide and make it, make it past that parity point. So now to the traditional chunk, energy efficiency in the built environment. Um, we went through and, and we summed up all investment um, in the U.S. for energy efficiency in the built environment, in the built environment, by category. So the, the first thing to really realize about this graph is that utilities are very much in the driver's seat of this industry. They represent the vast majority of investment. Um, the performance contracting industry is, is kind of second, and then a lot of money still coming from stimulus is, is third. Um, but then the, the interesting, more innovative financing mechanisms that are sprouting up, like PACE, which is a little bit older now, um, efficiency service agreements, energy efficiency mortgages, which is an idea that's been around for a long time, um, and for capacity markets, which are tied to electricity markets, where demand response activity and things like that happen, um, and carbon markets, which are yet another way to kind of channel money into energy efficiency. These all represent a pretty small percentage of cumulative investment but they're kind of the most exciting pieces of the pie chart. And there's kind of the most, the most innovative, creative ideas and work being done in those areas. So we also went through to, um, and this is a theoretical exercise to figure out what the investment potential is in all of these new financing categories. Um, and that's what this graph shows. So kind of listing from left to right all the different mechanisms I just described. Um, and there's, there's a whole research note we've written on this topic, kind of explaining methodologies and things like that. But what I want to point out is that the actual realization or the actual investment through all of these financing mechanisms is at most 1% to 2% of theoretical potential. So energy efficiency through new financing conduits is, is woefully underfinanced. Um, in fact, if you take a big macro view of the energy efficiency industry, um, about 30% of cumulative investment is debt financed, um, whereas the rest is, is equity and really special pots of equity, like from utility funds or stimulus, things like that. Um, but the real estate market, broadly defined, is, is more like 65% debt in terms of mortgages and things like that. So if energy efficiency is a facet of the real estate industry, which it is, um, it's, it's woefully underfinanced relative to it. So the last, the last slide, and I'll leave it on a positive hopeful note we we then projected what we think investment would be in energy efficiency by 2020 um, and we we did a variety of, of models for each of these buckets that you see here so utility spending and debt from the capital markets and then um, federal spending um, and then some other things like carbon markets and we think it's going to grow um, substantially um, and we think that that's going to create a whole lot of opportunity for industry um, and it's also going to do a, a fair amount of, of good that you know, the Alliance for Sustainable Energy and, and the Business Council for Sustainable Energy stand for. So that's, that's kind of the hopeful message, and, and I'm happy to provide you with details on how we actually created this, this chart and what our methodology was. Um, but for now, I'll just leave it at that. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Ted. Um, there's still a few seats in the front if people are looking for a place to get a little closer. So uh, thank you for your patience with this. It's great that we had such a good turnout. We really are appreciative of your time. I'd like to just take one moment before we go to our next speaker and welcome Lisa Wright. She is uh, Congressman Roscoe Bartlett's uh, chief staffer for the caucus, as well as works on energy and communications issues. Uh, she's been a true asset in putting these together. So Lisa, let me give you the floor and say a few words. Uh, thank you for putting up with me interrupting the program instead of joining you at the beginning. The congressional schedule is always exciting and dynamic. Um, I just want to thank everyone in this room, especially the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and the Alliance for um, to Save Energy, because without your pushing members of Congress, uh, we would not recognize the potential, and we would not support the potential for Americans to save money um, by spending money just on the energy that they use, rather than, as is far too often the case in the United States, on a lot of energy that we waste. Um, and uh, it's the messages that you carry to your clients and your potential clients about how they can reduce that dead weight for their household budgets and their business budgets and put more green into their bottom line by wasting less energy and using more renewable sources of energy. And that is something that will benefit our country greatly over the long term. And I thank you very much for carrying that message to the members that represent you in your House districts as well as in the Senate um, because members are responsive to their very most important people that they represent, the voters who hire them or fire them. So thank you again, and thank you so much for sharing with us the information about the trends in energy efficiency going forward. And enjoy the rest of the event. I am. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Rick Carter, Vice President of Federal Gov Government Relations for National Grid. He's going to start off the second panel focusing on trends and barriers to increased deployment and investment in energy efficiency. And he's going to focus on utility programs for energy efficiency. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Lisa. Good, a good afternoon. Um, as Lisa said, I'm with National Grid. What you may ask is a National Grid. Let me start there. If you're not from the Northeast, uh, you may not know. So let me just give you a little background that National Grid is a, is a British word. Uh, it means National Grid. So if you're in the United Kingdom, we are the backbone of both electric and, and natural gas uh, grid throughout, uh, throughout Great Britain. Uh, so if you're watching the Olympics tonight and the lights go out, could be us. <laughs> could be somebody else. Uh, but in the United States, we are a little different. We are a vertically integrated utility for the most part in a deregulated area of the country. We serve uh, New York, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. We are actually a very large company. We have uh, over 7 million customers. Half of them are electric customers, and half of them are uh, natural gas customers. And we have about 4,000 megawatts of generation on, uh, on Long Island. We also serve, uh, we work with the Long Island Power Authority to provide all their services for distribution and transmission on Long Island, at least for the next year and a half. Um, at the risk of offending my friends from uh, California, because I, I do have a, a long history in California. I don't know if any of you are here from California, but if anybody is from California, I just want to go over briefly to get this started. Is it recess or is that what that is? <laughs> it's like go out and play softball or something? All right. Um, <laughs> as you know, every year uh, the American Council for uh, an Energy Efficient Economy, also known as ACEEE, puts out a, a state efficiency scorecard. And uh, of course there's 50 states. We're not going to run through all 50 of them. Um, but we are going to run through the top five, of which number five is Rhode Island, which is one of our states. Of course it's tied with Vermont and Washington, so we'll give them some due credit. Number four, state of Oregon which is a beautiful place. Number three 
is another one of our states, uh, New York State. And unfortunately, uh, coming in second to the top state is the former number one state, nothing wrong with the silver, silver medal, but it's the state of California, which has been number one, at least when I worked there, uh, was number one over the last many, many years. But this year's new number one is the state of Massachusetts, which is an area where we do a lot of business, of course, and uh, have a very big commitment to, to energy efficiency in all of our states. Just a little bit of a historical perspective. We'll go over a little bit what's, what's happened historically with uh, energy efficiency, a little bit what's happening right now, and uh, then we'll look at what's going on potentially in the future. Uh, we've been involved with, with energy efficiency, either National Grid or its predecessor companies, for the better part of 25 years. In the 1980s, it was primarily de demand-side management, weatherization, strips, putting blankets around your water heaters, that type of thing. And for business customers, it was lighting systems, so cutting back on the amount of energy you used. In the 1990s, the depth of the programs grew. We got more involved in the cost-effective, high-efficient electric and gas technologies, building operation solutions and new construction offerings. Those programs continued to grow throughout the 2000s, the last 10 years or so. And today, we operate a very wide, very aggressive energy efficiency program across all three of our states. Massachusetts and Rhode Island are very similar. We, we operate those programs. And in the state of New York, we work jointly with uh, NYSERDA, which is uh, a state agency that is responsible for promoting, uh, promoting energy efficiency. So the types of programs that we offer, really you can break them into two categories, residential or commercial and industrial. Uh, the residential programs pretty much consist of product or appliance rebates, which en encourages customers to purchase equipment such as air conditioning, heating, lighting, and other ENERGY STAR appliances. And I can testify that when I replace my, my electric heat pump, I don't have natural gas in my house, electric heat pump, that the, the, my bill, so I'm assuming my energy usage, but my bill dropped dramatically much of the screen of Dominion Power, um, but they got over it very quickly. It also includes audit and retrofits, so home energy audits, identif identifying possible retrofits, and incentives for placing inefficient equipment or appliances. And then we also get involved in new construction, so technical and marketing assistance, monetary incentives for meeting, meeting certain performance uh, standards. On the com commercial and industrial side, uh, again, we're into retrofits. So offering technical assistance and rebates for the inst installation of efficient equipment. And also, again, involved in new construction where we offer technical and design assistance with rebates um, for high efficiency equipment in new buildings as well as major renovations. So our commitment in, in our three states is big. In 2011, uh, we spent $307 million. $220 million of that was for electricity efficiency. 87.5 million of that was for gas efficiency, and that represents a 29% increase over what we spent just the year before in 2010. This year's budget is, is about 500 million, so that's a huge jump on top of what we've been spending in the last couple of years. And this is in part because of the policies that our states implement. It's important to our states to promote energy efficiency. As was said earlier, a megawatt not used is a megawatt saved, is, is a is carbon that doesn't enter the atmosphere, is a dollar that isn't spent on, uh, on electricity or natural gas, and it's the, it's the best way to, we oftentimes call it our first fuel. So our results for 2011 is that we have uh, 1.3 million customers that are taking advantage of our, of our energy efficiency programs, and that's, again, a huge increase over just the year before where we had just under a million customers that were taking advantage. We saved 745,000 megawatt hours of electricity, saved 15.5 million therms of natural gas, and over the time period of 2009 to 2011, we have doubled the energy savings just from our energy efficiency programs and the huge ramp up that we've gone through in the last few years. So the future, what does the future look like? Well, one of the things that we're involved with, along with the Alliance to Save Energy and several others, uh, is an effort chaired by Senator Warner of Virginia, as well as uh, somebody calling, let me just put that out, as well as the, the president of our organization, Tom King of National Grid. It's called the Alliance Commission on National Energy Efficiency Policy. And the purpose of this is to look forward, 
to look at a new generation of energy, efficiency, energy efficiency in the United States to uh, try to double the productivity of every unit of energy between now and 2030. So it's, and we'll, we'll take a look at it in just a second, but it's brought together le leaders in a variety of fields, including energy efficiency ex experts, finance experts, people from academia, transportation, manufacturing, utilities, and, uh, and research members and others to look forward at what energy efficiency looks like going forward. We'll be making recommendations on the next generation of energy efficiency, again, to try and double the productivity of energy over the next 20 years across all sectors of the economy, transportation industry, power generation, and the connections between all, all of those. Um, and we hope to be making those recommendations by the beginning of the next Congress. And we hope to be making recommendations that are acceptable to both Republicans and Democrats, since none of us know who's going to be in charge of what come January. Just to give you an idea, um, these are the members. It's a little small, but we, I put copies on, on your tables. The members of, uh, of the commission. Not only do we have uh, Senator Warner and, and our president of our company, but uh, former Governor Pataki is, is also involved. Uh, who's, who's now involved in his own uh, private firm. But we have a good cross-section of business people, academics, energy efficiency people, environmental organizations. Uh, as you can see from this list, it's a, it's a very strong group of people that are looking at the future of energy efficiency. So what does that mean? Where are we going? Uh, if you look back into the 1980s when we were weather stripping windows and doors and putting these blankets around the water heaters, um, there was no such word as Wi-Fi back then. Uh, Apple was something you ate, or maybe it was a record label. Uh, Microsoft was kind of a pillow that you put your head on at night. And if you ever tried to Google someone, I can, I can testify that that was illegal in 49 states in the District of Columbia. <laughs> so we've come a long ways in a very short period of time. This thing that keeps dinging in my pocket, I think it's me, I'm not sure, maybe it's somebody else up here. But we used to have a rotary dial or a, a at best, if you, I mean, had a little one of those little princess phones where you push the buttons. I mean, this has come an awful long way in about 20 or 30 years where we run our entire lives off of, of our cell phone. If you lose your cell phone, you just got to go home and go to bed because your day is over. So likewise, um, in our world of energy and energy efficiency, the opportunity for continued growth is large, but it's also challenging. So what we need to do, we need to streamline programs to fit our customers' needs. We need to, to aggressively work with our regulators and legislators to define the programs and our common goals. We need to connect with our communities to increase the awareness and participation in these programs. And we need to continually expand the definition of what energy efficiency is. It is no longer just those weather strips or the blanket around your water heater. It is, goes, goes way beyond that to combine with new technologies that are emerging, including the phones we carry around in our pocket, the smart grid, real-time energy, real energy information, demand response, distributed generation, alternative fuel vehicles, and so on and so on and so on. The, 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 the list is endless, I believe. So the opportunity is there for us to do to Thomas Edison's light bulb what Steve Jobs and all of his friends out of Silicon Valley did to Alexander Grant Bell's telephone. So that is our challenge. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rick. Our next speaker, uh, just you know, following off of Rick's comments, our next three speakers are really going to delve deeply into what those opportunity markets are. So thank you for that good lead in. The first is going to focus on building efficiency in the heating and cooling industry. We're very happy to have with us Jordan Doria, Manager of Stakeholder Engagement for Ingersoll Rand, which also uh, owns the train company. So Jordan, the floor is yours. Do you have the remote? Yeah, Good. All right. Uh, thank you, Lisa. And I uh, want to thank the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus, as well as the uh, Alliance and the Business Council for sponsoring this event. Just briefly want to touch on the businesses that make up Ingersoll Rand. Uh, train is our single largest brand. It is the, one of the global leaders in heating, air conditioning, and building controls for both the residential and commercial 
uh, building space. We also have Schlage, which is security technologies, door hardware locks, also Thermoking, which is refrigerated transport and diesel reduction technologies. Under the Ingersoll Rand name, we do a series of industrial products like air compressors, fluid pumps, uh, hand tools. And we also have club car, which is uh, golf cars as well as low speed electric vehicles. And across this fairly diverse portfolio, what I can say with a fairly high degree of confidence is that all of you in this room have likely benefited from our products at one point in your life, whether it's getting fresh produce at the supermarket or uh, being cool or, or hot in your building as you would want to be or using a uh, door that was made by Schlage at some point in your life. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the facts related to energy use in the building environment and the connection to building heating and cooling, which is the focus of Ingersoll Rand's train business. You can see up here that U.S. buildings consume 7% of the world's energy and that buildings account for 41% of all the primary energy consumed in the U.S. Of that, about 37% goes to heating and cooling buildings. Um, so you can see the significant connection between building, heating, and cooling and overall energy consumption in the U.S. and really globally. And also you can see that there has been a significant decrease in the number of jobs uh, for the architecture and construction fields. And while that's somewhat separate and apart from the heating and cooling industry, our success is closely linked to that of the construction market. So as the construction market has, has uh, suffered, so has the heating and cooling market. More recently, you can see here a comparison uh, between 2010 and 2011 in terms of shipments of residential and commercial cooling products. Um, you can see that 2011 was a better year than 2010, but 2010 was hardly a banner year. Um, these numbers overall are still down significantly compared to the mid-2000s when we still had a lot of new construction. Um, but an important point here that's worth, uh, worth emphasizing is that what these numbers do not show what the efficiency breakdown among those products was. Um, we, we're not going to get into all the details of that, but I can say that at least for the residential market, the vast majority, 70 to 80 percent, are right at or very close to the federally mandated minimum requirements. So you see the majority of the market at essentially the minimum level. So the question is, what do we need to do to try and encourage people to make purchasing decisions of more efficient products? Really, that comes down to an issue of first cost. A lot of people ask, and I think it's a very reasonable question, if energy efficiency is so great, why don't people pay? Um, and, and I think that it comes down to this issue of first cost. Not that energy efficiency does not offer an attractive return on investment, because it most certainly does. It's that people do not want to wait to recoup those savings. They don't want to wait to make their money back. That's really the issue. So when we consider the problem in that light, trying to tackle it means that efforts driving towards greater energy efficiency need to be focused with great precision on the issue of first cost. There are a handful of legislative proposals being considered in this Congress which address the issue of cost generally, and to some extent first cost, they do so differently. Um, S-1000 in the Senate, the Shaheen Porton bill, or uh, H.R. 4117, the Bass Matheson bill, um, it's, its counterpart in the House, both address some issues relating to first cost and do focus on building energy efficiency, which is positive. Um, there's also S-3352, which has a component related to uh, tax credits for uh, highly efficient uh, chillers used to cool large commercial buildings and removing much older, um, less environmentally systems. And there's, I also wanted to mention the 25C tax credit, which lapsed this year. This tax credit was for highly energy efficient uh, home property, such as windows, doors, as well as furnaces, air conditioners, heat pumps, the products that Ingersoll Rand makes. Um, this tax credit has lapsed, but when it was in, in effect and when it was in effect at the uh, higher value levels that were enacted under uh, the stimulus bill, it had a significant effect on the market. Um, sales of the products that were eligible tripled when the credit was in effect, so it certainly had a, a dramatic market impact. Um, I think that many of the legislative options that are out there are good um, and would be beneficial for, for our industry and also beneficial to save consumers' energy. And I think it's important to remember that when we're talking about saving energy, Rob mentioned before um, $5,500 a year uh, that people will be spending on energy bills. If they have that mon money to spend on something else, they often will. That has a positive impact on the economy. If we can save schools money on their energy bill, they save $60,000 a year by 
engaging in a performance contract to save money with us or, or one of our peer companies, that can mean the difference between laying off a teacher or retaining that teacher. So there's a very real impact between saving energy and positive net result for the economy. Um, I'd say that some of the options out there are not, in our opinion, ideal to address the issue of first cost. And we think that there are some, some better models out there. And we're hopeful that in the near term, we'll have the opportunity to talk about what some of those models may be. So thank you all for your attention. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jordan. I'd now like to welcome Dick Munson, Senior Vice President of Recycled Energy Development, to come to the podium. Um, He's going to focus on industrial energy efficiency, combined heat and power, and waste heat recovery. Thank you, Dick. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, in my short time, I'm going to um, attempt to make uh, two recommendations and offer two uh, observations. Um, the recommendations, the first one is, when you think about efficiency, I encourage you to think broadly. Uh, most people think about um, the demand side for efficiency, which is clearly an important area. The demand side being how do you influence consumers to reduce their demand through better building design, through better insulation, appliances, etc. There is, however, if you think about the supply side, how do you increase the efficiency of the generation of electricity? Enormous potential there. The second recommendation is as you think about the efficiency on the supply side about um, generating electricity, think about what Thomas Edison did, and that is he realized he had two products, both heat and electricity. So try to think about them together. My observations are efficiency, as we've heard from our previous speakers, is really great for the uh, environment and also for the economy. When it comes to industrial energy efficiency, it's amazingly important as a key aspect of a strategy to increase the productivity and the competitiveness of basic American manufacturers. Why? Because at the moment, we, are re uh, we have enormous amounts of waste energy that are just being vented into the atmosphere. Suppose, how much waste is there? I mean, it, most policymakers, uh, and I, um, excuse me, um, and I think even economists would think that there's not supposed to be waste. But you ask any school kid to draw a picture of a power plant or a factory, and you get something like this. This is Homer Simpson's um, power plant. What's the biggest thing in here? See those little plumes that are coming off the cooling towers? That's steam. That's heat. That's waste energy going off in the atmosphere. That's profit being lost right out there. And the cartoon, unfortunately, is the reality. You drive by any power plant or large factory, and you're going to see plumes of steam that are waste. Uh, and waste means um, both pollution, and it means loss of economic value. So Edison had a better idea. He realized that when he built his first power plants back in the 1890s, he had two products. One was electricity, and one was heat. Uh, to make electricity, you basically boil water. You burn something to boil water. You make steam. The steam under pressure spins a turbine, spins a generator, and electrons start to move. In a typical power plant, after the, the steam spins the turbine, it just goes to go off into the atmosphere. Edison said, well, that's nuts. I can make more money if I sell that steam or that heat to the nearby buildings or the factories. So although his power plants, uh, his, the efficiency of his generators was really low in the early stages, you would think he was the innovator. Because he was also capturing heat and sending it to the buildings nearby, the overall um, fuel conversion efficiency in Thomas Edison's time is higher than it is today. That should be concerning. Why? Largely because over the past you know, um, 100 years, we have focused on electricity and forgot about steam or heat. And we have created a series of policy barriers to enhance supply side efficiency. In fact, the efficiency of electricity generation has been the same at a dismal 33% since Dwight Eisenhower occupied the White House. Most of you probably don't even know that Dwight Eisenhower was a president. But uh, <laughs> trust me, it was before Kennedy. It was a long time ago. Nothing has improved. That should be shocking and disappointing. So. Um, Edison clearly understood the business logic of thinking about both heat and power. There's also a, um, a clear environmental um, reason for doing it, because the combination of generating electricity and generating thermal energy accounts for 69% of total CO2 emissions in this country. 
That is huge. When you think about automobiles, we spend so much time up here on Capitol Hill thinking about how to increase the efficiency of our automobile fleet, and we should, because that's critically important. But it's 14% compared to almost 70. You've got to think about where are your opportunities for efficiency. Allow me to suggest, in my view, there are sort of two broad approaches of, of options when you think about trying to advance supply side efficiency. One is waste energy recovery, and another is um, cogeneration. This is a steel smelter in northwestern Indiana. Across the, on Lake Michigan is the skyline of Chicago. Um, this smelter, with the, um, hope of a local, with the help of a local utility and a developer, began several years ago to capture the heat that was coming off their coke ovens and coming off their stacks. And simply by capturing what had been wasted, they have the capacity to generate 220 megawatts of clean electricity, not burning any more fuel, not emitting any additional pollution, simply capturing what had been wasted. The environmental benefits are huge, but there's also a great economic story here, and that is that the company, because they are not wasting money through sending um, heat off into the atmosphere, are saving, they claim, about $100 million uh, every year. The other uh, approach is um, cogeneration or combined heat and power. The previous one captured heat that was part of an industrial process. The other way, or cogeneration, is think about Thomas Edison. They boiled water, made steam, spun a turbine, and then captured that heat for some other purpose. Um, let me just give three quick examples to give you a sense of the sizes and the fuels. Um, they vary quite dramatically. This is the Frito-Lay facility in Connecticut. They um, turn about 250,000 pounds of potatoes and corn into tasty little chip treats. Um, and that um, gas turbine um, using natural gas provides 100% of the facility's electricity needs and about 80% of the steam needs. This is an um, automobile manufacturer in South Carolina, BMW. Um, they use landfill gas um, that, uh, from a nearby landfill to power a 11 megawatt facility that's saving them about $7 million a year. Some of these facilities, however, can be quite small. This is a laundry service that basically washes the napkins and the tablecloths from various restaurants in New York City. So it's a small, two small uh, engines that are recovering the waste heat um, from their generator that's supplying um, this facility, both their electricity um, and the heat needed to dry um, the tablecloths. Largely unnoticed, um, there's a fair amount of CHP or cogeneration in this country. It's about 9% of U.S. capacity currently is from cogeneration. About 12% of the output of the United States comes from cogeneration. Um, that's actually more than all the solar, the wind, the geothermal, the biomass all combined come out of cogeneration currently. But if you look at this, we're way over here. Our international competitors are beating the pants off of us. And they've got a competitive advantage because they are capturing heat. They have um, less waste and therefore more productivity and more competitiveness. Why are we behind? Largely because it's difficult to do this stuff because of the policies largely that we have implemented that discourage the use of efficiency and, um, and capturing heat. This is a... Uh, a silicon furnace at a facility that would be an absolutely perfect project. Uh, to make silicon, you basically melt quartz rock at very high temperatures. There's a lot of waste heat that's coming off these furnaces. And in fact, the company now spends millions of dollars trying to figure out how to cool it off so it doesn't burn up the bag houses or the pollution control equipment. We could come in there, or any company could come in there, and capture that waste heat and generate about 65 megawatts of clean power. No additional fuel, no additional pollution, so there's a great eco um, environmental story, but the economic story is great. If they were able to save this money, they'd open up a sixth furnace, they'd increase employment by 20%, they'd become the world's most efficient silicon manufacturer, they'd bring silicon manufacturing back from China to the United States, but it may not be done. Why? Because, one, I have no place I can sell my, a, a market to sell my power. I can't sell at retail because the utilities have a monopoly that don't allow me to sell the power to somebody across the street or down the street. I could try to sell it wholesale, but the regional grids only uh, allow me to sell them on a contract from basis like the day ahead or the hour ahead. And I need a long-term contract to be able to go to a bank and get the financing that's needed to be able to um, pay for all of these expenses. 
The financing is a tough one for like the silicon manufacturer. They're unlikely to put up their own money because their core business is silicon and they're going to invest their money in their silicon process rather than in energy. And to be honest, Congress gives absolutely nothing to a project like this. You give tons to every single other ge electricity generation approach, nothing. No tax credits, no loan programs, no grants, nothing. Um, so as you think um, in the future about things, I would encourage you to think about um, creating markets for clean electricity. Um, the province of Ontario recently created a clean energy standard offer program, um, which means that I would be able to get a long-term contract if I can beat the utilities cost for them building their own new power plant. If I can do it cheaper, Ontario says I should get a long-term contract. The um, Republican legislature in Ohio recently allowed cogeneration and um, waste energy recovery to be part of their portfolio standards. The Democratic legislature in California uh, adopted feed-in tariffs so that cogeneration um, would have long-term uh, contracts. Financing, level the playing field, please. Um, on an efficiency standpoint, we've talked about how efficiency reduces pollution simply because you're not having um, waste out there. You should encourage, as you think about your clean air policies, to have efficiency viewed as a pollution prevention approach. And finally, the value of pro provided benefits. There's lots of great new research that's coming out of Carnegie Mellon and MIT that says that clean distributed generation, combined heat and power or waste energy recovery, provides enormous benefits to the grid that are not being recognized. You reduce line losses, you have less need for new power lines, you provide more stability by having reactive power and a whole bunch of other complicated physics things. We need to have the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission recognize those values and ensure that there are benefits, actually economic benefits, that go along um, with these things. So that's my spiel. I would return to the things that I started at the beginning. I encourage you, as you think about efficiency, to think about both the um, supply side and the demand side. I encourage you to think about both heat and power, uh, because I think if you increase the efficiency um, of both, uh, you're going to increase the productivity and the competitiveness of basic American manufacturers. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dick. Um, lots to think about. That chart where the U.S. is compared to other countries, I mean, quite remarkable. There's a lot of capacity and opportunity there. Thank you for sharing that. Our final panelist is Steve Kraut, Vice President of Government Affairs with Qualcomm. He's going to focus on the connection between information and communications technology and energy efficiency and smart services. So with that, Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank uh, the Renewable Energy Caucus, uh, the Business Council, and the Alliance to Save Energy for this opportunity uh, to present today. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on Qualcomm itself. Uh, uh, Qualcomm actually was a company founded in 1985, um, really based on Im improving um, systems efficiency. Uh, they met in the den of the home of Dr. Erwin Jacobs, uh, himself and several of his uh, <coughs> uh, key engineers, and thought about how they can develop communications um, technologies uh, and bring that to market. And one of the first uh, inventions they had was the development of Omnitrax, which is now the world's largest <coughs> satellite-based uh, uh, commercial uh, mobile systems tracking. Uh, for um, the trucking industry. So uh, back in 1985, they approached the American Trucking Association and said, look, we can provide system efficiencies uh, for your trucks and your drivers by tracking them via satellite so that you know when they are um, scheduled to arrive at a given destination, when they depart, and what kind of trouble they may have along the way, and you can keep your customers appraised. So we were really built on the foundation of providing systems efficiencies. Uh, moving on from that success, in 1989, Qualcomm developed what's called CDMA technology, Code Division Multiple Access Technologies, which is really a superior uh, wireless and data uh, product that changed the uh, global face of wireless communications uh, forever. And Qualcomm <coughs> uh, began developing chipsets, uh, CDMA uh, wireless communications, uh, around the world, 
And that has developed into the fastest growing market as we all now uh, use our smartphones on a daily basis. Uh, projections are phenomenal. Uh, uh, new growth uh, expected to be anywhere from 2.5 to 4 billion uh, new smartphones sold around the, uh, around the world uh, by 2015. Uh, so when I was asked to speak at this um, event and was told it's about energy efficiencies, I went back and took a look at what we all look at is Wikipedia and what is the definition for energy efficiency. Wikipedia says that efficient energy use, some call, sometimes simply called energy efficiency, is the goal of efforts to reduce the amount of energy required to provide products and services. So what exactly does that mean? Is it the goal of reducing the amount of energy used to, to develop a product? Is it the goal of making that product itself more energy efficient as, as it operates? Is it the goal of using that product in systems to develop better efficiencies? In actuality, it's all of those things and many others. Qualcomm develops both products and strives to make those energy efficient and uses those products to make systems more efficient. Interesting enough, Steve Howard, the CEO of the Climate Group with the Global E-Sustainability Initiative, uh, stated recently that Consumers and businesses can't manage what they can't measure. And the information and communications technology industry provides solutions that enable us to see our energy and emissions in real time. And that provides the means for optimizing <coughs> uh, systems and processes that make them more efficient. So ICT technologies really are key to gaining uh, significant energy efficiency um, uh, gains. Uh, uh, through, throughout the various business sectors, and that includes uh, transportation, electricity grids, buildings, uh, health care, and on and on and on. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the products. We make vast investments in R&D, uh, 2 to $3 billion annually, uh, to make smart and efficient products. One of our latest technologies is the development of the Snapdragon chipset suite. Uh, these Snapdragon processors, processors <coughs> uh, integrate both the modem and application uh, technologies in one single chip. And uh, because they uh, combine those two technologies, it, it provides for improved efficiency and power consumption, performance, and supports a compact form factor. And with the combination of these two, you can, uh, you can run multiple advanced apps simultaneously with minimal drag and performance on your battery. So these chips are being used in smartphones, tablets, uh, game consoles around the world and bringing greater efficiencies. And throughout this presentation, I'm going to show a series of videos because as you can tell, I'm a terrible public speaker. And I am also not an engineer, so I can't answer any of your technical questions. So we'll turn to the videotape. This is on the Snapdragon technology itself. So as you can see, 
as you can see, we're trying to wrap all of these application processing technologies into one single chip, improving the overall efficiency of that chip and the smartphone that you're using in your hand. Another one of our um, products that we're um, developing is called Mirasol. And this is a really unique display technology uh, that <clears throat> actually is used to capture ambient light, absorb that light, and through a series of reflective mirrors inside the display, reflect that light back up, and that is what you see on your, uh, on your display. And it provides uh, customers both a, uh, a superior viewing experience, but also um, you can use this um, screen in bright sunlight and still see uh, all the characters. So we have a video on this as well. there but as you can see <clears throat> by absorbing the ambient light rather than pushing it through from battery power uh, you can save battery life and we're now increasing um, the use of an e-reader from a day or two's use on one battery power to weeks at a time so it's really an innovative technology uh, it's now coming out in uh, places like Korea China <clears throat> and Taiwan and uh, we are hopeful that it will be introduced in the American market uh, in, in the not so long future. Uh, I know we're kind of short on time, but I did want to talk about uh, Qualcomm Smart Grid products too. And what we're doing here is we are using cellular technologies to promote the real-time transfer of data between customers, uh, uh, utilities, uh, and utilities to provide uh, uh, energy efficiencies. We believe that cellular communications are uh, <coughs> the best suited technology um, for the smart, bid, smart grid because they're widely available. Coverage is over 95 percent across the U.S. Uh, the investment, the, the investment uh, is minimal because you don't have to build a new uh, network. Uh, and you already have major carriers such as AT&T and Verizon pumping in millions of dollars every year to ensure reliability uh, and security of their systems. So all that comes through cellular technologies. Uh, and Qualcomm provides the chipsets uh, for these cellular technologies, both in the metering <coughs> uh, solutions, 
We have partnered with a company called SmartSync that was re recently acquired by ITRON, which is the uh, uh, major equipment uh, manufacturer of smart meters, uh, to provide cellular um, metering technology to utilities such as Consumers Energy, Texas New, Mex New Mexico Power, and Entergy. We also have a chipset called uh, Gobi Multimold that allows <coughs> um, you to connect uh, to the grid anytime, anywhere. You can even connect from, say, Verizon to AT&T in the event of an emergency. So you can bounce back and forth from carriers uh, and, and ensure that you're connected at all times. We are also developing smart communication nodes, partnering uh, with Duke Energy, who will use those to aggregate information and send that back from the households uh, to the utility. Uh, we have partnered with a company called Concert uh, Energy Management Systems, and they are a home energy management system company uh, allowing the consumer to go to a web portal, um, uh, choose their energy options, what time of use uh, they want their uh, energy appliances to be used, when they want their lights on, all from the computer, and uh, we have seen dramatic uh, energy efficiency savings uh, anywhere from uh, 7 to 54 percent with an average of about 17 percent. Uh, finally, we're uh, very much involved in the electric vehicle market. We are partnering with a company called Ecotality, which is um, uh, in the midst of demonstrating uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, including charges, charging stations in six major cities across the U.S. Qualcomm is providing chipsets that provide the real-time communication from the automobile uh, to the charging station itself and then back to the utility. And if we have time, I'll show this final vehicle, um, video. So since the electric grids have been built all around the world, they really haven't changed all that much. In fact, if Thomas Edison were alive today, he would take a look at the electricity grids as they stand, and he really wouldn't notice any difference. But now the idea is to add advanced two-way communication technologies such as cellular, and then closer into the home or in small businesses, looking at technologies like a home plug green fi and Wi-Fi. And this is going to allow utilities and third parties to have real-time access to the state of affairs on the grid at any one point in time. And this will allow for a more reliable, more energy efficient, secure grid that will reduce the need to build more power plants, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore really take the grid to the next level. And then that's what this is all about. Qualcomm, we are a next generation mobile technology company. And we take those technologies and we incorporate those into our chipset solutions. And those chipset solutions are used primarily in mobile phones, but they're also used in smart meters, electric vehicle charging stations, and, and other aspects of the electricity. So as an example, some So I will end it there and appreciate your time. And uh, we look forward to increasing energy efficiencies across the globe. Thank you very much. That was excellent. I mean, it's, it's really amazing how information and communications technologies is underpinning so much of the, in the innovation in energy efficiency. You know, Jordan, you talked in, in your comments about new and innovative uh, financing models that you think would be useful. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what Ingersoll Rand is and others in the space are contemplating? Sure. So uh, from the Ingersoll Rand perspective, um, one of the forms of incentives we most often deal with, at least from, from the federal government, would be tax credits. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this that I don't need to belabor for this audience, but um, one of the major obstacles with that is that there are a significant number of people any given year who don't have any tax appetite, um, probably around half, and that's true for both the residential and commercial markets. So already you've eliminated approximately half your potential market. When you also start to consider the fact that you people don't always know what their tax liability is and that from a, from a marketing perspective you can't necessarily be construed as giving uh, tax advice, it's, it's not something legally you can do, it's actually difficult to some extent to use tax, uh, the tax code as a vehicle to drive sales. Um, I, I would say that I think 
from our perspective, one of a better new model might be something that would be like a replenishable rebate um, subsidized by the, the federal government utilizing the, the proven energy service model that uh, Ted and others have mentioned. An energy service model basically is an energy service company like Train would come into a building and say, we guarantee uh, savings of X amount and you'll recoup your investment over seven years um, or five years or whatever it may be. Um, a recent National Renewable Energy Lab uh, study of over 18 years and 2,800 projects nationwide found that 85 percent of those uh, ESCO projects met their target. It's a proven and reliable means, but the difficulty is still that one of upfront cost and getting the financing. And if you were to remove some of the transaction costs from that by having the federal government provide it and then having it be replenished instead of paying back the uh, energy service company like uh, train through through energy bill savings, you would simply provide that money back to the federal government. You would have a single pool that would be used continuously, and it would be a one-time deal, and you'd also know what the spend is, whereas with a tax credit, you don't know until after the fact. So um, I think there are a lot of reasons to consider other models, and, and I think from a business perspective, that would be a, a, an effective one and would also help potentially um, save money in, in the long term for the federal government. Thank you, Jordan. I would just note that the Business Council for Sustainable Energy is the administrator of a coalition of ESCO companies. A few are council members, a few are not, but we can get more information on that type of model. And one thing that you talked about in your comments was the no upfront cost, but as, as you know, with that financing model, the customer does not need to put money up front. So that's one of the, I think, angles where it could be useful. But now I wanted to just quickly ask all the panelists to respond to one question, and then the floor is yours. You, know, you mentioned the federal government. We are here at the House of Representatives. Many of you work on Capitol Hill or are involved in policymaking. From the federal context, what would be most useful for government leaders to do to drive energy efficiency at the consumer level and drive energy efficiency investment. So I think what I'll do is perhaps I'll start with Dick Munson and we'll work our way all the way down. <laughs> they didn't know that was coming. No. <laughs> um, I'd encourage you to think about how do you create markets for power? How do you create a free market out there for um, entrepreneurs to be able to sell their power into the market? And I think, you know, to be honest, we're dealing with a situation where Utilities um, regulation, which has largely been a state issue, but the FERC has a, a lot of authority, as do you, over it. They have had no incentive whatsoever to think about efficiency. There are some utilities, and, and National Grid is clearly the leader here, that has realized that it's wiser for them to invest in efficiency than spend the money on new power plants. But that's not true of most utilities. We need to figure out some way to incentivize utilities to get into this game, to do cogeneration or waste energy recovery. But give me a market and I'll, um, we'll change the world, I think, and eliminate an enormous amount of waste. But at the moment, there is no market for entrepreneurial power out there and you guys can change that. I think one important thing that, that Congress could do would be to consider how to better democratize energy information. And that means make it known and accessible to people because today it simply is not. And I think that's something that could potentially cut across party lines. Um, to allow the free market to operate effectively, you need symmetric information. Unknown information from an economist's perspective is asymmetric information. When it comes to energy, that's what we're all faced with. So it, it should be a free market approach by trying to make energy more known to people. You can better allow them to make decisions around their energy use. And we believe if people had better access to information, they would make decisions that supported energy efficiency far more often than they do today. And I think that that's an argument that should be able to cut across across party lines, ideally. So the, the vision really is that other people's money or the capital markets um, make money by investing in energy efficiency. The government essentially spends multiple billions every year to try and create a marketplace for energy efficiency, yet it's not, it's not there. Um, you can't invest in energy efficiency. Um, you can't get direct exposure to energy efficiency. There are some savvy private equity funds that can, and they are making a lot of money doing it, um, but most people can't. So what needs to happen really is a self-sustaining market for energy efficiency. What um, both Jordan and Dick have, have made a, a strong point of mentioning is that the upfront cost problem is why energy efficiency doesn't happen, whether in the context of CHP or residential energy efficiency. Um, it's not matched well. The appetite for payback 
is not the same for a homeowner or an industry as it is for, say, a pension fund or somebody with a longer, um, a longer time horizon on payback and a lower risk appetite. So if there is a financing vehicle that can uh, kind of solve that imbalance, then you end up with an entirely new asset class. Um, this is at a time when the financial markets are getting hammered. Deutsche Bank just announced today they're laying off 15,000 employees, 90% of which are investment bankers. Right? So <laughs> this, is, this is dire times for, for finance, and they're, they're trying to find a way to create new things to do, new investment opportunities. Um, and this could just be one of them. Yeah, I'll, I'll just suggest, and it's a message that we have been um, carrying to the Hill for the last, well, for a long time. But, and oftentimes we say business needs more certainty so that we can go ahead and make the investments and, and, and move in the direction we're supposed to go. We, I don't, we don't use the word certainty as much because nothing's certain uh, except death and taxes, and even taxes aren't so certain right now. But what we need is more clarity. Um, we need policy clarity coming from the federal government. Uh, but then at the same time, a lot of our programs are driven at the state level. Uh, some states, some of those that we, I listed earlier, have a very advanced energy efficiency programs. Other states don't have, have different types of programs. So we need to make sure that what we do at the federal level doesn't overturn or interrupt what's being done at the state level. Uh, and that takes a lot of coordination. So I, I would think going forward, the more we can, be, we can clarify our energy policy and our energy efficiency policies, the better off we'll be to help invest in this going forward. Yeah, I guess I would say from the mobile world perspective, um, first and foremost, we need to ensure that there's adequate spectrum available so that we can take care, uh, take advantage of the inherent um, systems efficiencies uh, mobile communications um, brings to us all through our smartphones and, and the other technologies that I mentioned in a presentation. Um, with respect to energy efficiency specifically, um, I guess we would be, uh, you know, support supportive of a voluntary industry-led uh, efficiency standards and making certain that you're harmonizing those standards um, on an international basis um, because it is a global economy now and uh, uh, it's very difficult when you have to um, deal with different uh, uh, regulatory initiatives uh, on a country co by country basis. Well, thank you. So now's the time where we let all of you ask some questions. So I see all the way in the back, I see at least two. Why don't we start with you? I need to repeat Brandon Smithwood with Ceres. Okay, so let me clarify, what public policies, if you had to pick a couple or three, what would you call out public policy-wise? So, so you're right. ESAs are, are a good choice because they're policy agnostic and they're utility agnostic. Um, which means they're not slowed down by, um, by kind of large agencies with, with bureaucracy. Um, my, my personal favorite financing mechanism, not today, but in the future, is energy efficiency mortgages, actually. I think once um, the mortgage market kind of heals itself, which will take time, um, it makes a lot more sense to institutionalize finance for energy efficiency, kind of throw it right into the mainstream of how you already finance buildings which is a mortgage, and you create a better mortgage product that is an energy efficiency mortgage where there's kind of lower operational expenditure and therefore less risk of non-repayment, which means you can, in theory, have a lower interest rate, which means people will have more demand for it. So it's a virtuous circle kind of thing. Um, in terms of, in terms of uh, investor appetite and big pension fund appetite for energy efficiency debt, the best way to do it is probably PACE, property assessed clean energy taxes because you can securitize larger bundles of PACE obligations relatively easily or easier than anything else. Um, so what that means is you need policy, you need very local policy that enables PACE. And there's only a few regions that have enabled PACE and there needs to be a lot more that enable PACE. And that, I mean, I'll, I'll just keep it at that because it's one, it's simple, and I, I think that's essentially, and it's, it's a battle being fought at a mayor level. Um, and that's, that's what needs to happen. Thank you. Uh, there was a gentleman here who had a question. Well, as I mentioned, uh, y you know, we're, we're always supportive of uh, increased availability of spectrum. Um, with relation to the smart grid itself, um, uh, you know, there is a debate on the use of the 700 megahertz um, spectrum uh, for the public safety community and whether utilities will have access to, to uh, that spectrum as well, or even the public carriers. Um, uh, I think that um, technology will eventually dictate how that spectrum um, is utilized. 
uh, because there are ways uh, in which uh, both the carriers, um, companies like Qualcomm providing the um, chipset technology can partner with public safety uh, and the utilities to maximize the use of, of that spectrum and, and uh, uh, you know, lessen the, um, the, the, the pressure uh, or the lack thereof of, of existing spectrum bands for the smart grid. Thank you. We have time for one more question before we close. Any takers? I see what gentleman here. Yes. Sure. I, you know, I'm sure I'll give an opportunity brief, very briefly for others to respond, and I would like Rob to follow me. You know, the Alliance to Save Energy is a board member of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. But as a coalition of renewable energy, energy efficiency, and natural gas sectors, we want to see all the clean energy extenders move forward, w those that have expired already, as well as those that are expiring. We've been working very hard in, in the House and in the Senate and with the administration to make that happen. Rob, do you want to speak more specifically on 25C? I think going forward, to, to, to kind of tie into what Rick was saying, without having the law either extended, there's no clarity from the private sector's perspective. So you have these provisions that have been afforded for years or have been extended through um, various vehicles, usually passed at the end of various Congresses. But as a result, um, the current law is no longer on the books. So from the private sector entity's standpoint, how do they really plan in the event that they're utilizing these financial mechanisms to make their either their businesses and or their supply chains more efficient. Um, just this week, there has been talk of the Senate Finance Committee addressing a tax extenders package. Now, what that will include remains to be seen, but um, the Business Council, the Alliance to Save Energy, and a number of energy efficiency stakeholders and industries have been weighing in repeatedly with the Ways and Means and the Finance Committee or those are the committees of jurisdiction that would handle these policies uh, to either extend and or possibly modify or improve upon them. Uh, but it's, I know it's not a specific answer, but it still remains to be seen as to how they will be addressed either before the election or shortly thereafter. Okay, well now I get to turn it back to Rob, who's going to give some closing remarks. Thank you, Lisa. Well, in conclusion, uh, we've heard a lot of very substantive comments about various operations and strategies that are being employed through a very broad spectrum of industries and stakeholders. And I think based on all of their presentations, there's one statistic I'd like to throw out there because I think it links very well with a number of the salient points that have been articulated here today, and that is a 2009 report by McKinsey and Company estimated that with government assistance, a $500 billion investment in energy efficiency could result in $1.2 trillion, that's with a T, in savings and a 23% per reduction in projected non-transportation sector energy usage by 2020. That is significant. Uh, and that is, again, by employing a lot of strategies, incentives, and other policy mechanisms, some of which have been discussed here today, including appliance standards, tax incentives, research development and commercialization, energy efficiency in federal facilities. The federal government is the largest consumer of energy in the United States. I think that is something that uh, bears repeating going forward and looking at ways in order to reduce our consumption. And then you're also talking about Department of Energy activities or policies that they would ultimately employ. And then finally, the, the policy and legislative initiatives that are either driven at the state and local levels, uh, again, some of which have been discussed here today, including the PACE program, which is done without any federal assistance or involvement. It is entirely handled uh, prior to the recent decision that was rendered uh, by the uh, Federal Housing Financing Administration, uh, or FHFA, uh, again, at the state and local level. It's, it's done uh, through bonds that are paid back through property taxes for uh, the owner of the primary residence. And they're also looking at commercial um, sector as well. So those are just a couple of examples 
of how efficiency can really be applied to a number of different sectors. And just to, to, to really kind of close the, the loop on our presentation today, the general public has been calling for quite some time um, and urging Congress to work in a bipartisan manner. And the Alliance to Save Energy, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy are bipartisan organizations. We work with all policymakers of all different political stripes and ideologies. And our purpose is really to help uh, a lot of stakeholders and federal and state governments to really kind of spur economic growth and create jobs, which is in keeping with what the electorate has been, again, calling for for some time. So disagreements really remain on how to kind of address national energy policy, and particularly on the supply side problem. But there's broad consensus as evidenced by our panel here today and the work that our organizations have been conducting for more than a number of decades that energy efficiency is still the quickest, cheapest, and cleanest way to address energy waste and the demands that are placed on businesses and consumers as a result of it. So effective energy efficiency strategies will, should not only play a role in meeting this demand, but will also incentivize greater technological advancements and cut energy costs. And that's something that I think everybody can agree on. Um, and so given our high levels of unemployment still in the United States, rising energy prices and stiff global competition, energy efficiency is truly needed to move our nation forward. So we look forward to, uh, no pun intended, working with all of you. Uh, we ask that you consider uh, contacting either the Business Council for Sustainable Energy or the Alliance to Save Energy or any of the uh, stakeholders represented here today to work collaboratively with us. And I would also like to remind everyone here participating today that the presentation is being videotaped, as evidenced by the camera right over there and the spotlight. <laughs> and you can get a copy of the presentation via the Alliance's website, and that's ase.org backslash resources. So again, that will be readily available in a very short time, probably later today. If not today, then tomorrow. And we again, thank you for your participation and your interest, and we wish you a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you again.